Here is our speaker, author, historian, entrepreneur, <laughs> park guide, and uh, chief bottle washer at the uh, at the museum. Okay. Mike, that, Mike, that may be one of the best introductions I've ever had. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's great to see everybody tonight. Happy Veterans Day uh, to all those who have served. Um, happy Remembrance Day as well. And, and as some of you may have noticed, I know we've got at least a couple of Polish Americans on here. Happy Independence Day to the Republic of Poland as well. Um, so it's a great, it's, a, it's an auspicious day. It is great to see everybody out here this evening. Um, and thanks, Mike, for what you do and putting us on with the CWRT Congress. This is some great stuff. Um, and if you haven't been to some of these programs, I encourage you to check out more. There's some really great stuff. Um, and like Mike mentioned, we've got some great stuff at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. We're downtown Madison, right opposite the Capitol. I'm going to talk a little bit about the museum tonight in our presentation. Um, and certainly in a group like this, I know there's going to be um, some questions and discussion. I look forward to that afterwards. Um, what I'm going to do, I've got a big topic tonight, the Grand Army of the Republic. And for some of you who already know some about the Grand Army of the Republic, you realize what a big topic it is. And so what I'm gonna try and do tonight is give you what I term the beer and pretzels overview, if you will, give you a sense of what it is, give you a sense of, of a little bit of, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions, there's a lot of things about the symbolism of the GAR that, that may or may not be fully aware. And so there's some things I'm gonna show you. Um, actually from the Veterans Museum collection, we have a fantastic collection of Wisconsin GAR related stuff. Um, and so we're gonna sh show you some of that as well, tell you some of the stories about the GAR and some of their activities and hopefully illuminate um, this, this perhaps somewhat forgotten and certainly perhaps now underappreciated uh, veterans organization and what it means and what its legacy is still visible with us today. Um, so with that in mind, I have a uh, tempestuous relationship with PowerPoint, but I'm going to try this anyway to share my screen and then start my PowerPoint. So let me get that going. Is that showing up? Yes. Are we, can you guys, okay, cool. That My title slide there, good. Okay, so that's who I am. That's what we're gonna talk about tonight. If you get nothing else out of this talk, um, I want you to walk away with these key points here, is that the Grand Army of the Republic was a major presence in the United States for the half century or so after the Civil War. It had its political aspects, had its social aspects. We'll talk about both as we go. In some ways, it's a model for most of the other veterans organizations we're more familiar with today. And I'll spend some time exploring that a little bit later on. And perhaps most importantly, if nothing else, the Grand Army of the Republic has left the legacy that is visible in the United States today. And we're gonna spend some time exploring that as well, not just what this organization was, but what its legacy is that's still left with us today. Now, before we talk about the Grand Army of the Republic and what it is, and I, that's what's coming up on the next couple of slides, I wanna place the GAR within context of other veterans organizations that you may be familiar with, either that existed either prior to the GAR, which is Civil War veterans, or existed concurrent with the GAR in the case of the last bullet here. The Society of Cincinnati was for Revolutionary War officers of the Continental Army, the Aztec Club was from 1847, from the officers that went with Scott to Mexico City, um, and it was an association for them. Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with the monuments they placed on battlefields and other, and other places, and of course the massive collection of documents that they have since donated, I believe, to Carlisle Barracks um, up in Pennsylvania. Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States is also officers of the United States Armed Forces during the Civil War. And then of course, at the bottom is the United Confederate Veterans, um, which, is the, which is in many ways the equivalent for Confederate soldiers of the Grand Army of the Republic. But you'll notice for the first three in particular that involve US service veterans, it's all officers. And that's something that makes the Grand Army of the Republic unique. And so now let's explore, just giving you a little bit of quick Quick survey context as to how the GAR fits in. This gives you an idea of some of the precursors of what it was. The Grand Army of the Republic dates from April of 1866. It was founded in Springfield, Illinois by Major Benjamin Stevenson, formerly the surgeon of the 124th Illinois Infantry. 
The first post that was created was in Decatur, Illinois. And I'll talk about the structure of the organization here in just a little bit. But right now I wanna give you, the next couple of slides give you a real basic overview of this organization and what it was. I want you to focus on the third bullet there, which is the principles, the principles that the GAR was founded on, fraternity, charity, and loyalty. And you will see these three principles permeate through all of the activities of the organization. Let's unpack them. I want to spend a little bit of time unpacking each one and what it means and how it might manifest or how it does manifest itself with the GAR. The first is fraternity. This is something worth, worth pointing out. There were 2 million people that served in the United States Armed Forces during the Second World War, or during the Second World War, listen to me, during the Civil War, 2 million. It was the largest, largest the United States Army was until 1917, 1918. For many of these people that went out, it was a, first of all, it was a generation that mobilized. But for many of these people that went off to serve, for some of them it was the first time they ever left their county. For many of them, it was the first time they ever left their state. For many of them, this was either A, the defining event in their, in their life, or B, it was the jump off point. It defined the rest of their life in some way, shape, or form. It either opened up horizons. Many of them ended up moving west afterwards. Many of them were based on what they saw, got into politics, a lot of different things. And so for these veterans and the camaraderie that they forge in military service, as they come home after the war, many of them want to find a way to hang on to that. And that's fa it's fairly common if you consider the World War II generation or the Vietnam generation, or even today, the American veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan. They want to hang on to that element of fraternity because when you think about it, when you mobilize that percentage of the United States population, which the United States in 1860, the Union States had 21 million people. Uh, some of you are better mathematicians than I, you can do the percentage of that. When you mobilize a, a generation, this marks a generation in a way that, for example, the mass mobilization of World War II marked that generation, or the Vietnam War and the draft marked the Vietnam generation, this generation as well. And so this idea of preserving that brotherhood that was met on the battlefield, the idea of preserving that community and that idea of continuing those bonds that were built during the war becomes something that many of these veterans want to do, maybe not immediately after the war, but certainly in the several decades after the war. And so fraternity is a big part. And you will see as we go through, you will see, for example, the structure and patterns very much of, say, the Freemasons, where you've got the local lodge, in this case, the local post. You have to be voted on to come in. You have to submit an application packet and they have to vote on you. You can be blackballed, just like in, in fraternities and college fraternities and things like that. But this is as much as an expression of community as it is anything else. So that's one of the first things is fraternity, this idea of continuing the bonds, the brotherhood that was formed in union service. The second is charity. And we'll be exploring that as we go. Um, this is something of an extension, if you will, of the spirit in Abraham Lincoln's um, second inaugural, where he talks about to care for him that is born to battle, his widow and his orphan. And so you'll see some of this and you'll see how it manifests it as we go. But charity is definitely, this is not just a social club. This is not just a drinking society. This is not anything like that. There's also some effort to uh, do good works for the veterans, for the widows, um, and, and any other cause that they choose to support as well. And then the last one is loyalty. Loyalty is amongst the members, but loyalty is also a to the nation. And you will find, particularly as the GAR moves along, it becomes very much a patriotic organization. Patriotic education becomes part of it. At the end of the presentation, I've got the charge that was given to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum by one of its first directors who was a GAR member, and you'll see how this plays out. Um, talks about transmitting an intelligent love of country to the next generation. These people saved the union. And so the idea of keeping that spirit alive, influencing the union, um, and getting, getting politically active, um, demonstrating that loyalty, continued loyalty to the United States, the continued loyalty to each other, and the continued loyalty to the cause that they fought for and bled for from 1861 to 1865. 
that's another principle that the GAR is going to, is going to be standing for. So keep these three things in mind, fraternity, charity, loyalty, because you'll see this drive everything that the GAR is about. Here's another thing that's very important to remember about the GAR and distinguishes it from what the, the ones that we have seen that have gone before, the major veterans organizations that have gone before. Unlike the others that are only officers, only U.S. officers, this is open to men of all ranks who served honorably for the United States during the Civil War, Army, Navy, all services. It's also open to USCT veterans. And there are at least 10% at one point of the GAR membership were African-American veterans. And some of them ended up being officers in their posts, for example, up here in Wisconsin and elsewhere is also. And I should point out as well, there are two documented women members. Um, these were women that had, had dressed up as men and had served um, until discovered and then sent home with discharges. But these two, at least two documented women were um, were members, we've been able to document two for sure that were members of GAR um, as well, Sarah Emma, Emma Edmonds and Katie Brownell. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as well. But this is part of the overview of the Grand Army of the Republic and what it is. But this is how it is, this is its founding principles. Again, very different from the veterans organizations we've seen before, but it's also a very different conflict that they're coming out of than what we've seen before also. Here's a little bit more of the overview for you, give you a little bit more of a sense of the GAR. It existed 90 years from 1866 to 1956. It has sustained annual membership from 1883 to 1908, over 225,000 people. Its peak membership was 1890 with 410,000 members, which is approximately one quarter of the 2 million in the United States Armed Forces that served in the Armed Forces. Six of our presidents were members of the GAR. Um, and as I mentioned before, political force, again, that patriotic, organ, uh, patriotic education, civic education, getting involved in the, in political, the political um, um, debates and discussions and movements in, in the United States in the, in the decades after the war becomes a political force. In some places, you can't be nominated for governor, governor, mayor, local office. In some states, you can't get the, the, the presidential nomination without the GAR endorsement. Um, so it's, it's, a very, it's a great political force. And much like, for example, the World War II voting bloc or some of the veterans voting blocs that we may be familiar with over the last 50 years, it's a political force in and of itself just by delivering those votes, either in an election or uh, as a caucus in a legislature. One of the platforms that they are very much an advocate for is veterans and families. Keep in mind as well that this is, this is a new thing for the United States um, when you consider how we, that we're treating our veterans a lot better after the Civil War and with a lot fuller services. Of course, not the same as the GI Bill after World War II, but we are starting to treat our veterans more um, and with the creation of the Veterans Affairs Bureau, originally now the VA. Uh, they're an advocate for this. They're an advocate for continued services to the veterans and the families. And then there's members in every state and every territory. And I'll show you I'll show you some of the some of the basis of that or some of the, some um, evidence of that as we go. But that's this slide and the slide before give you a sense of what the GAR is and what it stands for. Here's the structure. There's a national commander. I'll show you the ribbon of the national commander. It's really interesting how they structure their their um, their office insignia and things like that. Then below that, there are state departments. And it's usually one department per state, although that's not completely the case. I'll show you in the case um, in Louisiana and Mississippi, they're combined into one department. Um, but the idea is, is that you have at least one department per state. And then within each state, there may be districts, like a larger state, like Pennsylvania, you might have an Eastern Pennsylvania district, a Western Pennsylvania district, things like that, smaller states. Um, you may just have the state commander, and then below that, the local post, which would be in each of the communities. They're all numbered, and they're all named either for a prominent local person, a place, some cases a, a battle, or a historic event um, that is chosen by that place and is chartered by the State Department, um, and then ultimately, of course, approved by the national office as well. So it's, it's a highly structured organization in some ways replicating the military structure, if you really think about it, even down to the title department. If you're familiar with the Civil War, 
You think about what you know of the Civil War organization, the Department of the Cumberland, the Department of the Ohio, the Department of the Mississippi, for example. You can see this structure continuing through this. There's an annual uh, encampment for all posts in a particular state. Um, and then, of course, there's one national encampment every year as well, and we'll talk a little bit more about those as we go. And then, of course, there's also special reunions that GAR will support, the GAR national commanders will support. Notably, of course, the 50th anniversary in 19, between 1911 and 1915, uh, notably the Gettysburg 50th in 1913, and then, of course, the 75th in the late 1930s, and, of course, the Gettysburg 75th in 1938. Um, and then in addition, the Grand Army of the Republic, <clears throat> excuse me, much like veterans organizations, some of which veterans organizations today in your communities, local parades, they're always marching in local parades, they're conducting local, local reunions, social events, um, much like the VFW Post today, for example, has been a community center in many American towns, the GAR Hall served that purpose as well. And we'll talk, we'll I'll show you a, a few examples of this as we go. But this is what the, this is a little bit of the structure. This is a little bit of kind of the formal, we talked about what the GAR did. This is the structure of how it does it and how it pursues what it does. I threw this in here. These are a couple of, I'm gonna show you several things out of the Veterans Museum collection, just to give you something of an idea. This here on the left is the GAR Garfield Post um, in Wapaka, Wisconsin, in North Central Wisconsin. And they would carry this flag um, on parade. Um, and then to the right is a banner you can see for the GAR post in Beloit, uh, Wisconsin, named for a local officer. Um, and you can see the different numbers, number 35 on a Garfield post, number 54 um, in Beloit. Uh, but you can see different flags and banners and things like that. This is an example of a GAR hall in Massachusetts. Um, not all of them are this ornate, particularly when you get into some of more of the more rural areas or the small town areas, they might actually be just wood structures. Um, but this is a pretty ornate one actually in, in Franklin, Massachusetts, in downtown Franklin, Massachusetts. And you notice, I would point out um, the monogram up here, but also the flagpole. You'll always find a flagpole and they'll always raise the colors every meeting of the GAR post. Um, and so you'll always see that. It's usually somewhere in the, in the middle of town or near the middle of town in a very central location. Um, again, becomes a very prominent landmark in many of these communities. Now, one of the things about the Grand Army of the Republic is that they will adopt ceremonial uniforms. Um, and this is an example of a ceremonial uniform um, that will be worn by the color guard, will be worn by officers. Um, and if it looks familiar, it should, because it is patterned directly off of the US Army uniform of the Civil War. You can see the kepi, you'll see here, it says GAR with a laurel wreath of victory around it, the white belt, Instead of US on the center, it says GAR intertwined, of course, four button, the four button sack coat as well. And then the GAR ribbon, I'll show you a close up of this here in a minute. This is the GAR members ribbon. And you'll notice if you look at a lot of pictures of veterans post-war, um, this ribbon shows up in a, lot of, in a lot of people's, a lot of surprising places and on a lot of people's portraits. And I'll show you a portrait of some members here in a few minutes. This becomes a very much a point of pride for all veterans to wear their GAR, uh, their G GAR medal. And I'll show you a close up of that again. But I just wanted to point this out. Again, comes back to that idea of that the Civil War was one of the defining events in many of these men's lives. And this is a way that they're trying to hold on and trying to hold on to that, that uh, fraternity, trying to recall those experiences and continue that ethos forward into the next decades of their lives. Because um, for many of them, remember, most Civil War veterans were in their teens or 20s, or maybe their low, you know, low 30s. We think of the generals, even the generals were young. Most of them were in their thir 30s during the Civil War. Um, so this is a very, you know, fairly young generation that gets marked at a very young age and then continues forward. I promise you, just taking a look at the ribbons. The ribbon here on the left is your standard, all over the country, according to Hoyle, GAR member ribbon. You'll see the eagle atop the cross cannon, of course, the flag, stylized flag. And then if this looks familiar, most people look at it and say, how did so many people get the Medal of Honor after the Civil War? That's because they borrow this design from the Medal of Honor. 
but it's not. The easy way to tell the difference is to first look at the ribbon, because the American, this is not the Medal of Honor ribbon, but more importantly, look at this area right here, because the way the Medal of Honor of that era is done, it does not, it is not crowned with the eagle and the cross cannons like this. So, but this is your GAR. Whenever you see this ribbon on, on somebody wearing it right here on somebody's chest, you know they're a member of the Grand Army of the Republic and they're very proud of it. So that's your mem post member. Now, remember I told you about how they wear uniforms and I talked about the military style structure that they do as well. It also goes in officer insignia because you'll notice what the post commander's ribbon is what he wears at the top of his. That's the insignia for Colonel. In other words, the post becomes a metaphorical regiment and when you're elected and they change officers every year, when you're elected the commander of the post, you get to become for a year, you can be reelected, by the way, there's no term limits, but the custom was to serve about a year or two at the most. You become the, the Colonel of this, this regiment, if you will. And then the deputies would be wearing, for example, Lieutenant Colonel insignia, Major insignia, and so on down the line. Uh, but keep this in mind that this rank structure, they borrow the rank structure of the U US Army um, for their ribbons. Um, and it's a way, again, a, re a, a language symbol that everybody understands. Um, that when you see a, somebody with an eagle, and an officer's what a replica of uh, officer's shoulder strap. You know that that's the colonel, that's the CO right there. Uh, but these are these two here represent some of the most common GAR ribbons that you will find out there um, in, a, in a collection, a museum, whatever. Uh, this by far on the left being the most common, and then because the post commander was by far one of the, the most numerous elected offices in the GAR, you'll see these as well fairly prominent throughout. Um, throughout the GAR. Here's, promised you a photograph of some of the GAR members. Here's some of them here. You'll notice they're not wearing uniforms, um, but these happen to be some of the incorporators of the Wisconsin Veterans Home at King, which I will show you, I'll talk a little bit more about as, a little bit later. But one of the reasons that I include this is, you'll notice every single one of them is wearing their GAR ribbons. And a couple of them are members circling the member ribbon here, but you'll also notice a couple of them are officers because of the top of their ribbon here, you can see are a little bit different. But you notice all of them are making a point of wearing their GAR ribbon with pride. And you'll see it again and again in photographs and in portraits um, that they'll wear this as a point of pride. I serve, I'm proud to be a part of the GAR, I'm proud of what we have done on the battlefield. One of the other neat things about some of these uh, posts, not all, but some of them, and I ran across this in our collection and I wanted to share it with you. This comes from the GAR post in Madison, here in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, the head of this gavel, and again, they'll, you know, the gavel to, that the commander will use to govern the meeting, the head of the gavel is made of wood from the stockade at Fort Sumter, which for those of you scoring at home is more famously known as Andersonville Prison Camp. And this is being, this is, if the inscription is in honor of the Wisconsinites that were held and some of whom died and are buried in Andersonville today. And so you'll find these throughout GAR posts around the country that some of them will adopt relics related to some aspect, either of their community, some of their members, whatever, relics recalling and again, establishing that connection to their service during the war. And so I just, I, this was pretty neat. I wanted to throw this in here. Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's one of those things that's, that doesn't, doesn't look like much until you know the backstory. And then when you start to really think about the backstory and start to realize why they chose to do it and what inspired them to do it, you begin, it, it adds many layers and begins to, it's a, it's, it says so much in just a simple artifact. This is the ribbon for the state commander. And you'll notice this is actually Augustus Weiser, again, out of our collection, who was the state commander in 1888. You could design certain elements for yourself. That's where you see the badger here, department commander for the Department of Wisconsin in 1888, GAR. Um, and you'll notice by this point, because the membership really starts to take off in the 1870s, and by the 1880s, you can really tell the money that's flowing around the GAR because of the quality of worksmanship but also notice the jewel encrusts on the two stars. 
which is the rank of state commander. Um, and you can see that, and the, the worksmanship here, the craftsmanship is very, very good. And so that tells you something about the, the money that's coming in, both from a financial perspective, but also from a, a prominence and a power uh, perspective of the, how this organization has continued to grow and build. And we're only two years before the peak membership, by the way. So that gives you an idea of kind of where we are. But that's, that's what the state commander would wear. And one of the things I like to point out, you'll notice two stars, just like an army commander or a division commander uh, during the war. Here's some of the State Department ribbons. Again, I promised you I'd show you some of them. Um, some of them are from the National Encampment. This one here is from the Department of the Ohio. Um, the National Encampment was in 1880. And I'd like to point out that the GAR, one of the misnomers may be that the, the GAR only existed in the states that were part of the Union during the war. That's not completely true. The states, they added departments either in the territories or later as the states developed. I know Mike, for example, being in Washington State, it was, it was a GAR Department of Washington out there. And the National Encampment here in 1880, and the National Encampment, you can tell if you look at the years and each year when they move around the National Encampment, you can almost chart the, the development of the country in some ways by where they choose to have the National Encampment. And this is one, San Francisco, August 1880 here. Um, here's Illinois, George Thomas Post, as you can see here, number five, I, I threw that in there for that. Um, here's the National Encampment in Washington, D.C. from a Massachusetts post um, that you can see here. Again, the membership ribbon here. Uh, and then this I like to throw in here because a lot of people think it only occurred in the, in the, the GAR only existed in the North. Um, carpetbaggers took the GAR South to be very general about it, but also U.S. military personnel that had been Civil War veterans that were stationed around the country joined the GAR. And that's where you get Things like this, the Department of Louisiana and Mississippi, which existed in 1894. And this is from a ribbon from one of their representatives to the National uh, Encampment in Pittsburgh in 1894. And then the uh, Illinois, you can see the Illinois here with the picture of their state commander um, in Minneapolis is the National Encampment there. But this gives you an idea. The reason I included these is not so much to talk about the National Encampment. We're going to talk about that a little bit in a minute. But it's more to show you the variety of the state state. Uh, departments and to show you kind of the, the geographic reach of the GAR, both in terms of where it has its national encampments, but also where it has its state departments as well. This is a national organization. It's a national force in a way that is really hasn't been seen very much in American history among veteran organizations up to this time. This is the National Commander Ribbons. Um, here's the deputy commander here to the left. You'll notice the three stars. And then the four jewel encrusted stars here for the national commander. Um, this is actually Weissert after becoming commander in Wisconsin. He goes on to be the deputy commander and then ultimately the commander um, in 1892. And he got to design his own. And you can see right here in the center, if this looks familiar to anybody, that's the 15th Corps Corps badge, the cartridge box with 40 rounds. And because he was a veteran of that Corps, he decided to pay tribute to his old wartime unit in his national ribbon. And so when he wore this all around the, all around the country that year as commander, uh, he was paying tribute to his comrades. Uh, but the, look at the craftsmanship and the jewels on it. I mean, you can tell that this is, this is not a poor organization by any stretch of the imagination. It's got financial muscle, it's got political muscle um, for sure. And again, you'll notice Medal of Honor continues to be a motif, a unifying motif of all of these ribbons. Here's some notable commanders, names you probably recognize. Um, John Logan was not the first commander, but he's one of the first early prominent ones. Of course, Ambrose Burnside, Charles Devins. Um, if you're familiar with Chancellorsville, he's the guy on the end of the line that Stonewall Jackson surprises at Chancellorsville. John Hartranft, who was governor of Pennsylvania. Um, John C. Robinson, Medal of Honor at Spotsylvania, and then Lucius Fairchild, the former Iron Brigade commander, later governor of the great state of Wisconsin. Um, but these are the, some of the notable commanders of people that you, that you would probably recognize. And here's some other national encampment ribbons. I just put these in here just to, again, show you the geographic difference, but also you can see how the, the, each encampment has its own design. Some of the commanders will put their portraits on them, as you can see here. Um, some of them will highlight the city as well. Here's Kansas City, the heart of America in 1916, I believe is when that was. This is the 1939 ribbon here. 
which occurred August 27th to September 1, 1939. And when you think about what's happening August 27th to September 1, 1939, in fact, which is the last days of peace, and then of course, September 1st, 1939, the invasion of Poland, which starts the Second World War. This ribbon, is, what this symbolizes is an interesting juxtaposition of one of the last encampments of the Grand Army of the Republic at the start of the Second World War. So something to think about, but there's some tremendous symbolism in here related to the different cities. And you can see some of these actually, there's a whole, probably a whole art exhibit in GAR ribbons and their symbolism here um, when you go through it. This here in the center, this is Los Angeles in the first decade of the 20th century. Again, I point out the geographic moving around. You can chart the, diff, you know, the, the, the development of the country. And you'll notice the bear in the center, bear flag republic for the state of California. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot of, just, just a lot going on in these ribbons. And these went to all the participants and were collected as souvenirs. In fact, these are all from Weissert's collection. Um, he collected all of these um, to commemorate all of the ones he went to. These were highlights for many of their members in their calendar, both the state encampment, but also the national encampment as well. What would they do at the National Encampment? They'd be there for several days. Some of it was reunion, some of it was parades. Some of it was just doing this where they'd camp out. And you can see the old Sibley tents, you can see company streets and they would hang out and they would reunite. They, they enjoy some fellowship, enjoy some campfire. They do some national business. They usually have the, they always have the national elections and elect a new slate of officers every year. Um, or every other year sometimes. Sometimes you'd reelect the same slate for, two, for a second term. Um, but you'll notice the flags. I mean, it's a very military sort of atmosphere here at the National Encampment. You'd get thousands of, of these. Among the, the, the GAR veterans, um, it would vary in percentage of who would come. But when you consider, for example, in 1890, there were 410,000 veterans. Even if you have 10 uh, 410,000 members, even if you have 10% that show up to the national encampment, you're talking about a lot of people. And I'm not saying it was always that high. I'm not even saying it was that high, but you get the idea of just how big these events could possibly be. And then in 1913, of course, the Grand Army of the Republic supported, and this is one of the famous handshake photos from that, from the Gettysburg reunion in 1913. Uh, but the GAR was a, was a big proponent of this, um, promoting loyalty to the United States, but also through that, trying to create some reconciliation uh, with the United Confederate veterans. Can you guys, can you all still hear me? My pictures, oh, there we go. My picture froze for a second. I'm just making sure I'm still, am I still here? I'm yeah. seeing Mike smiling, so I'll take that as a yes. Um, this is the 1914-49 encampment. This is the last one. There were nine veterans that attended this encampment. And this is the last commander in chief, Theodore Penland. And he actually had served in an Indiana regiment. His dad was killed at Stones River. And then he served later on. He lied about his age, he was 17 during, at the end of the war. Um, and he lives, this is, he's just turned hundred. He'll die at 101 in 1950. And at that one, they decide the best thing to do, we're not gonna hold any more elections. And when the last veteran dies, they have the power to sign over and make the final disposition for the GAR. Um, the Grand Army of the Republic had made an early decision that they were only gonna be open to Civil War veterans. They were not going to expand their membership beyond that. There are auxiliaries, there are various things we'll talk about, one of which transmogrifies into the uh, legacy organization, if you will, of the Grand Army of the Republic. We'll talk about them in a few minutes. But this is the last encampment here in Indianapolis in 1949. Um, and so I just wanted to point this out to you here. Um, and when you think about how the world is in 1949 versus how the world was in 1865, and you think about the changes in these, these guys' lifespans from the end of the Civil War through to this point, the last effective national encampment and the last effective action, if you will, of the GAR before it dissolves itself, um, that's a powerful, yeah, that's worth, worth pondering. And that's a powerful thought when you consider how long the Civil War veterans really were with us and really were a presence to some degree in the national discourse. Now, I talked about the, the, the first part I talked about, really talked about the fraternity, talked about what the, what the organization did. 
I haven't really, I mentioned I was going to talk a little bit about some of the charitable things that the, that the foundation or the, the GAR did. One of the things that they did was they lobbied the federal government to set up the first veterans homes. And you'll see the first network of federal veterans homes start to start to prop up after the war. There's one in Milwaukee, for example. Uh, but there were several others that later become the network of the VA hospitals, ultimately over, over a period of decades. But in the 1880s, in particular, several state departments, among them the Department of Wisconsin, will charter a Grand Army home. And the Department of Wisconsin and the National GAR will support these financially. And they're going to be a home for veterans. And when you think about where you are in the 1880s, if you're a 20-year-old kid in the 1860s or a 30-year-old in the 1860s, by the 1880s, 1890s, you're starting to, with a life expectancy at the time being in the early 60s, you're starting to reach the point where you might need community, you might need medical care, more constant medical care, you might need the services that a veteran's home like this might provide. And so the GAR will create these in many places. And this is the, the home up in King, up near Wapaka. Here's the headquarters here in the top left. There's a, a variety of little attached and detached homes. You'll see people will dress formally for dinner. They'll eat in a communal mess hall. It becomes a real community. It's open to veterans and their families. It's also open to widows as well. Um, I like this here to the right because the original term, it's now the Wisconsin Veterans, veterans uh, Home at King. But for a long time, it was known as the Grand Army Home. And you'll see this in other states as well, Massachusetts being another one where their veterans homes were originally Grand Army homes as well. I believe New York is another one, but there are others around the country that are now state operated veterans homes that actually had their start under the aegis of the Grand Army of the Republic. And you'll see the military theme continues here. These cannons are still in place that were placed there by the GAR. These cannons are still in place on the entry drive into King today. Um, so again, hearkening back to the service, hearkening back to the Civil War, um, and really taking that charity and caring for the veteran, veterans care, you know, putting, putting their money where their mouth is, as it were. As the GAR begins to lose membership and it be, its strength and financial resources begin to sap as the 20th century progresses into the first few decades, the GAR will successfully lobby the states initially to support the homes, and then later in most cases to take over the homes. And that's what has happened here in Wisconsin. It's what happened in Massachusetts. It's what happened a lot of other places as well. But when you see a state veterans home, many times, not always, but many times, if it goes back into the 19th century, it had its start courtesy of the Grand Army of the Republic. And when you consider there's never been anything like this before in American history. We're used to the GI Bill. We're used to the network of VA hospitals that was set up after World War II in earnest in particular. Nothing like that existed before the GAR started lobbying the federal government and then started doing this on their own in the latter part of the 19th century. And so this is a legacy of the GAR that is sometimes forgotten, sometimes unremarked, and is actually extremely, extremely appropriate to talk about here on this Veterans Day. A couple other quick legacies I want to talk about real quick because I want to have, leave some time for questions. Um, the Veterans Museum was started by the Grand Army of the Republic. We were in the GAR Memorial Hall in the state capitol and then later moved across the street and ex expanded. But the GAR was responsible for making sure the battle flag collection was preserved. They did this in a lot of other states. A lot of other state departments did the same thing. Because I run the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, I have to talk about this. I want to talk about this. But this is a legacy of the GAR that they do, preserving their story for the generations to come. Other notable GAR memorials, Memorial Day. Let's start with that. John Logan Proclamation in 1868 is one of the origins of Memorial Day. Um, and it's worth pointing out, why, is, why does the United States have Memorial Day separate from Remembrance Day, November the 11th, like the rest of the, those countries that fought in World War I? Well, it's because we'd already maimed a generation before in the Civil War. And so we already had a Memorial Day. And it was 1868, John Logan is commander of the GAR pro proclamation. US-6, many of you live in states where US-6 passes through from its length from Massachusetts to California to the Grand Army of the Republic Highway. There are museums to the GAR in Springfield and Philadelphia. And I should point out the one in Philadelphia with COVID is having a tough financial time. 
I'll just leave that fact. You can do it as you will. Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn. Many of you are probably familiar with that. You've probably seen the arch in movies. Grand, dedicated to the Grand Army of the Republic. And then one of the, the only um, memorial in the former Confederacy in front of a courthouse dedicated to Union soldiers from that county is in Greenville, Tennessee. And it was raised by Burnside GAR Post in the Department of Tennessee. And so I like to throw that. That fact may win you a bar bet one. Last encampment of the GAR was 1949. The last veteran, Albert Wilson, died in 1956. And at that point, he signed over the GAR legally to the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War, the SUVCW. Some of you are probably familiar with that. Some of you are probably members. Um, and that has become the legal successor to the Grand Army of the Republic. They inherited the records. They inherited the structure. They inherited, they basically are the legal successor to the GAR. For those of you who have been to Gettysburg, you probably have seen old Albert Wilson, who served in Minnesota for 13 months. He served in a Minnesota unit for 13 months at the end of the war. Never was at Gettysburg. But if you remember where the old, old uh, visitor center is, there's that old gentleman sitting on a, on a stone throne as you're driving from the angle up to the visitor center. That's the GAR Gettysburg Memorial. And that was put in after his death in remembrance to him and his comrades and the last veterans of the Grand Army of the Republic. So every time you go to Gettysburg, the GAR has a presence today. We talked about legacy. We've talked about legacy of the GAR. One of the other things I wanna mention is the legacy of the veterans groups that it influenced today, both in terms of structure, in terms of mission, and in terms of just general priorities and how to continue to care for veterans and to continue to advocate for veterans. And you can see the ones, some of which have gone away, like the United Spanish War veterans. But the Legion, the VFW, Battle of the Bulge, Vietnam, all those still exist, except for the United Spanish War veterans still exist. And in some way, shape, or form, they draw some of what they do and or how they do it from the GAR and its examples. And so this is a living legacy of the Grand Army of the Republic as much as any memorial or anything else. And last but not least, the charge to the veterans. The last lingering desire, so far as their country is concerned, they may leave it enshrined in the hearts of young men and women who are being educated as to become leaders of thought and purpose in their day and generation. And they shall transmit an intelligent love of country to those of generations yet to come. That is the message from the GAR. That is what, one of the things that they were about. And that is one of the things that animates us at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum today. And so that in a very quick beer and pretzels overview is the Grand Army of the Republic. And I'm gonna stop sharing here in a second. And I'm just gonna say thank you for your attention. And uh, Mike, we'll open it up to questions. Ah, oh, that sounds good. Boy, that was quite a uh, presentation. So, let's take a look at chat. Do you, uh, do you want me to read the, uh, the questions to you? If you want, I can just go right through them. Okay, go ahead. Let's do that. Uh, was the vote for admission intended to weed out those known to have deserted and or bounty jumpers? The short answer is yes. And that's why they created, there were certain documenting standards that you had to have to document your military service. Uh, much like today, for example, to, to be a member of, me, of the veterans organizations, many of them you have to produce your DD-214 or you have to produce some other documentation of service. And it's part of that gatekeeping to avoid, you know, avoid deserters, bounty jumpers, things like that. And it's a way to, to kind of gatekeep um, for that. Was there an organization for non-officers in the earlier wars? Um, if there is, I haven't found it, Rosemary. Keep in mind as well, until compulsory education in 1844, the officers in the army were the ones that were educated. Most of the others were not literate. So there may be, that may be part of the reason as well. So that, that's a whole other talk for a whole other time though, Rosemary, that's for sure. Did the numbers of the posts run nationally or were they numbered within each department? Just like the Masonic Lodges that you may be familiar with, or the VFW, the VFW posts are national, but like the Masonic Lodges, they are consecutive within state. So for example, there's a post that I showed you the post 54 out of Beloit. There would have been a post 54 in Pennsylvania. There would have been a post 54 in Illinois. Um, there was a post number five in Illinois. 
um, and there was another post number five in Massachusetts. So it was within within the State Department itself. Is the middle GAR marker on a union grave emblematic of GAR membership or acknowledgement of Civil War service? It's GAR membership. That's one of the last things. It's much like the Masons putting the square and compass on their tombstone. Um, having the GAR marker, that's, in fact, placing that marker is one of the final, uh, the final thank yous and one of the final goodbyes of the comrades of your post. Is there any record of acceptance or rejection rate for applicants? I'm sure there is, Paul. You'd have to contact one of the GAR museums. From what I can tell, if you, just like the Sons of Union veterans today, I'm eligible. I have the documentation. I've been told all I have to do is submit the documentation and I'm pretty much automatically in. If you can meet the requirements, the documentation requirements, plus you are vouched for by the members of that post, they'll let you in. They don't exist to try and you know, keep people out. In fact, it's a very inclusive organization. There, there were black members. There were Native American members. Um, you know, so it was a very, very broad membership. But within that, to the previous question, you know, they did want to screen and make sure that that it was people of good character and had been had served honorably in the armed forces. Uh, let's see. How competitive were the elections for national and state office? Quite because each state could nominate candidates and it was not always, um, it could be quite contentious from time to time, uh, particularly certain states, well, it's politics. It's like politics of any national organization to be quite honest with you. So they could be very competitive for sure. Uh, my understanding is the American Legion came from a French design after World War I. Why wasn't there some joining of these two groups? That's true. The American Legion was partly based on, was inspired by the, some French veterans organizations. The Legion of Honor, for example, comes to mind, which is also where the U.S. gets the Legion of Merit. That inspires the, the whole deck order of the Legion of Merit. Um, the Legion does come from that but it borrows many of its structures, particularly the national organization and then the state organizations from the Grand Army of the Republic. But one of the things that the Legion did very differently was they decided not to um, limit themselves to just World War I veterans. They opened it to everybody because the Grand Army of the Republic always never wavered on the idea that we are Civil War veterans only. There was some discussion at, from time to time about do we open this up to other people? Do we open this up, you know, particularly the Spain, you know, war with Spain veterans and then later. And it was always we are Civil War veterans. And that's what we shall be. And when there are no more Civil War veterans around, there won't be a Grand Army of the Republic anymore either. And so that's why, to your second question, that's why there wasn't some joining of the two groups. Were they often at the same events? Did they often work on some of the same issues for veterans? Were they often you know, working the same patriotic priorities? Absolutely. But it was one generation, the 19th century generation, Civil War generation represented by the GAR versus the World War I and beyond generation represented by the American Legion. So hopefully that comes somewhere close to answering that question. Did the GAR do a grand review parade at any of the national encampments? The short answer is yes. If you go on the Library of Congress uh, website and do, do an image search, you can find some of those parade pictures, both local parades, but also some of the national parades. Um, and that's one of the things they did, absolutely. Part of all this is the fraternity, but part of it also is the pageantry. You got a sense with the ribbons, with the banners, things like that. Part of it is trying to recapture the pageantry, the uniforms, things like that. So absolutely. You mentioned the Milwaukee Veterans Home. Paul Ibels, I expected this to be from you, but it's not. Is this the same soldier's home by Miller Park that is being rehabbed for current veterans? Absolutely, it is. And I'm very proud to say that the Wisconsin Veterans Museum is providing uh, copies of the artwork out of our collection to help decorate that uh, and, re, and make that tie between the original GAR and the original Civil War veterans up to the veterans that will be cared for once again in that home today. So yes, that is the one over by Miller Park. Uh, for those of you who have been to Miller Park, 
And if you haven't, come on up and watch. Come on up. It's a great, great place to watch a game. I know, Mike, that's that's something you'll probably do, being the baseball fan you are. Uh, let's see. Thank you for mentioning Philadelphia. Yes, and I see the website there. Um, and I think that answers the questions. I see a couple of comments, which I, I very much appreciate, pointing out some of the many legacies. I mean, you find the GAR all over the place, um, around the country for sure. So. Well, we're not. Oh. Are, are there other questions? Um, I don't Mike, am I on mic or not? I guess. I hear you, Tom. Okay. I The question I had, uh, the 1880s, whatever, is this huge development of fraternal organizations in America. Mm -hmm. The Elk news, the blah, blah, blah. Did the GAR ever have uh, secret uh, rituals or passwords? Were they more like that or were they more like our American Legion today? My sense is they're more like the Legion. They, um, it was a fraternity. It had a lot of the trappings of a fraternity, but it was also an inclusive veterans organization. It was designed to be a civic organization as well. Whereas if you consider some of the other fraternal orders that were created at the time, like the Odd Fellows, like the Shriners, they had a fraternal, a, a fraternity was kind of their priority, priority thing. Um, so this was, the GAR wasn't really designed to have a secret element to it. It was more of a civic group that had membership standards. Um, you notice how proud everybody was wearing their ribbons. There wasn't much secret about it at all. They had some of the trappings of those fraternal organizations, yes, because of the pageantry of it, they recognized there was value in that. But no, it wasn't, there, there was a difference in that sense. All right, if I may, a follow-up question. Uh, as a <laughs> Vietnam vet area guy, uh, the Legion sort of became a place to hit a bar and these old guys would go in and sit in the Legion and drink. Did, did the GAR have that type of an atmosphere or not? Oh, it was a, it was part of social club. I don't, some others may have a better insight into this. I don't know if it ever became I don't know if it ever became quite like going down to the VFW hall or the Legion hall and playing, you know, playing poker and, uh, and, and, you know, having fellowship around the bar. There was an element of that, but I'm not sure how much it, you know, I think, I think it had changed as because society had changed later as well. Um, there were more outlets for community and there were more, it was just a different definition of community and how you related within your organizations in the 19th and early 20th centuries than you would get after World War II. So if others have anything to add to that, feel free to do so. I had a question. I have a question. Um, Let's do Rosemary first and then we'll get to the other questions. Go Thank ahead. you. There's the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans Association, and I wondered whether that was similar to the ones that you were identifying, or is that basically a political group? It's, it's similar to the GAR in the sense that they advocate for veterans issues, mm -hmm. but it is very different in the sense that there's not, it, it, it's more of a national membership organization than having the state level or the local presence. Um, yep. As opposed to, for example, the Vietnam Veterans of America, which was founded in, eight, in 1978, has a national organization. Or the Military Order of the Purple Heart has a national organization, but there's also state chapters and local chapters. You don't really have that necessarily with the veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan. The part of that is the wars are still very recent memory. The GAR, the heyday of the GAR, when we think of it, even though it started in 1866, really didn't happen until about 15 years after Appomattox. And we're not 15 years after that war is over. Yeah. Vietnam Veterans of America, if you look at the creation of, of VVA, it started in 1978, but it was really about 10 or 15 years after 1973. So in other words, the mid to late 80s is when VVA really starts to find its voice and find its structure and, and start to really grow in its membership. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see over the next five or 10 years how With Iraq and Afghanistan veterans develop. Yeah. So 
Good question. Well, the other question, okay. I had another question out there. Yes, um, I, I I stepped away from my computer for a second, so I hope I didn't miss this. Did uh, could non commissioned officers and just general listed personnel become uh, leaders, uh, officers of guard posts and commanders? Most definitely, most definitely. And in fact, national there were quite a few national commanders that were former enlisted personnel. In fact, the last national commander of the GAR, that Theodore Penland that I talked about, was actually an enlisted as a private in the Army. Um, so it, and that's one of the things that set the GAR apart among its predecessor veterans organizations is that no matter what rank you held on active service, it, you could hold whatever rank within the GAR, whatever position within the GAR. So yes, in that, that's that's the long-winded way of saying yes. It was open to anybody, whatever rank. Another question, if I may. We talked about the politics that they were very uh, Republican-centered in the 1880s and all. Were there also Democrats, or did it? Did they? How did it structure between the two major parties? In general, because in an, an organization that size you're gonna have a full spectrum of political opinions. By and large, the GAR supported Republican causes. And the reason that they did, the, the, the big reasons they did that is first of all, the Civil War veteran presidents were all Republican. So it was GAR members, supporting GAR members. There's also Lincoln and the fact that it was, you know, the comrades that they fought and served served in the war were holding office as generally, not always, but generally as Republicans after the war. And the Republicans were supporting the causes that they wanted to support. That doesn't mean they were all Republican, but it does mean that, that when they threw their weight around politically, it tended to back uh, causes that were being backed by the Republican Party. And I ask a follow-up question to what you just said. What was the relationship between the GAR post and the union leagues? Because to this day, the still existing union leagues are Republican. That's true. And a lot of times they worked with the union leagues. I will tell you as well, on the other side of the spectrum, um, they worked with, there were some GAR, GAR posts that also worked and GAR members that supported uh, prohibition because you get the temperance movement that starts in the 1880s, 1890s, and of course, it's all the way up to the amendment. And so you do have uh, prohibitionist GAR posts as well. Um, the big thing that the GAR uh, tended to recognize was be active, be active in this country that you helped save, and in it's helping chart its direction. Um, you had freedom of choice in terms of how you, you know, what cause you chose, you chose, but there was no question that, uh, that they, for what they were trying to achieve in terms of political objectives for the nation, but also for themselves as veterans and their families and widows, orphans, um, they would work with whoever they needed to. And in this case, the union leagues, for example, come to mind. Are there any other questions? Well, kind of a backup to that. Would you say there is one thing you could hold to say is the legacy of the GAR as it went into the 20th century? Would it be uh, veterans affairs today or what would be one legacy that would, we would grant to them? I would say it's two, I would give you two. Memorial Day, every, every May Memorial Day, that's, that's a living legacy of the GAR. Okay. I would argue that might be their greatest legacy. But right there with it is the veterans' homes, the ethos of veterans' care, and laying that groundwork of what has become the Veterans Administration today. You can draw a straight line from the GAR and its advocacy for veterans' homes, the creation of veterans' homes after the Civil War, through the GI Bill in 1944 to the way we care for our veterans today. And it starts, it starts in the post-Civil War period. And the GAR has a very important role in that. So I would actually, I, I give you, 
I'm not sure. I don't want to have to choose between the two of those because I think they're both very critical legacies to this country. And you can make that choice if you if you so feel fit. Well, let's let's make that the uh, the last word. Thank you, uh, everyone, for being with us tonight on Veterans Day. Interesting. Thank you. And, and thank you, um, uh, Chris, for a wonderful presentation. I know we all learned a great deal. Very good. Thank you all very much. Great discussion. Hope to see you all in Madison sometime. And if nothing else, check out the museum online. We've got some great stuff.